morning. Had David Love's portfolio been handed to me five minutes later than it had, one fateful morning in April 2003, I might be standing here to tell you about someone else altogether. On that day, I was headed to a meeting to offer the position of painting and drawing teacher to a talented artist recently transplanted from New York when I was intercepted by a breathless colleague and told very pointedly, you have to see this portfolio before taking one more step. I don't know whether it was the forcefulness of the command or the sheer passion in his tone, but I stopped, opened the portfolio, and swooned. Inside was the very best collection of student painting and drawings I had ever seen, and I had seen a lot. Meticulously crafted, intelligent, at turns provocative and utterly compelling, yep, this was a master teacher at work. A quick redirection in our meeting had us stealing David Love away from the University of the Arts to transform the 2D studio and to help build our own renowned art program. Lady Luck smiled on us that day, and GA hasn't been the same since. The promise of brilliance held in the portfolio was, has been fulfilled tenfold in David's work with students and the community at large. He's inspired a generation of students to embark upon notable careers in the fine and applied arts. They come back often, and they love him dearly. A renowned artist in his own right, holding a BFA and MFA in printmaking and drawing, and a postgraduate degree in painting and intaglio, David has had a storied 30 year career exhibiting art nationally and internationally. His musings and meanderings exhibit, mounted just upstairs last fall, invited us to understand the long arc of his creative journey, culminating in prints that reference graphic novels, primitive art, and modernism alike. Renowned, too, in the field of art education, he's a frequent lecturer at state and national art ed conferences and a founding member of PrintLinks Philadelphia, an organization dedicated to the art of printmaking in high schools. And eager to broadcast the work of his students, he uses his wide and deep connections in the region to arrange for exhibitions at high-profile venues such as Penn State Abington, the Woodmere Art Museum, Philadelphia City Hall, Tyler School of Art, and the NAEA Conference in New York City, to name a few. To list his accomplishments in the visual arts area alone is to miss some of his greatest contributions to the school. He is a beloved advisor, a careful mentor, and a generous colleague. His collaborations with teachers are legendary and a model for how art seamlessly integrates into academics and school life. David works across the divisions on special art projects for younger students, extending the purview of art to include programming with CSO and the Community Partnership School. He has spearheaded alumni networking events, visual arts college night, careers in the arts, and this year, Art for Change, underscoring art's ability to give voice and create positive change in the world. I have relied on him so heavily over the years to help deliver our programming that he does this work so well and so humbly makes it all the more impressive to me. So when you'll hear students remark, D-Love, Dr. Love, D-Sauce, he's the best, you know what they mean. I'm proud to call him a colleague and a friend. I give you David Love. Touch turns into a bit of chaos and confusion. 
And everything from my art to my wardrobe, yeah, Miles rips my meat from my monochromatic wardrobe on a daily basis. <laughs> I seem to live in the murky waters of the middle ground, trying to best find balance. Inevitably, I'm in limbo, between light and dark, between bright and dull. In conversations, my mind swings wildly between different points of view, and this creates more than a little sense of confusion in my life. This general state of semi-controlled chaos ensues in all aspects of my life. Here's, uh, you see an example of my art. Uh, that, that's my brain in that middle section there. Um, on my desk, the counter when I cook, my plan book, and my studio. All in all, I guess I function all right. So I guess I've gotten used to it, and my family and my students, well, they come to kind of expect or accept that. This confusion may stem from the fact that the idea of an outline, a plan, a destination, <coughs> has barely skimmed the surface of this here brain. Or is it vice versa? Uh, anyways, my mind wanders endlessly, bouncing from idea to idea, and in ways it is no small miracle that I am here. So this talk is about how I got here, or for those that care for a more formal title, uh, what you might call finding my way. So get ready for what will be a meandering ride, with a few straight lines, just like my life. And oh yeah, I apologize in advance if the thought of a life like this provides nightmares. <laughs> for a long time, I lived each moment as it came, with little thought to any kind of destination. I walked through life quite fond of daydreaming, and possessing a childlike sense of wonder. I am not all that into horoscopes, but I hear this is quite common of us Pisces, and, and possibly even more so with left-handed ones like me. I am not sure if this came from my artistic inclinations, which have been in place since four years old, or vice versa, but there has always been a fascination with the visual world and a desire to record it on paper. Since a young age, I drew everything I saw in front of me, from objects in my home, um, to people, places, you name it, and I drew it. I drew it home, in school, and since my parents saw I had this passion, they supported it by enrolling me in various weekend art classes. For years, all I wanted to do was draw. It fulfilled me, it fascinated me, and it challenged me that much. And in many ways, this continues to this day. This skill served me quite well through my early years in art school, where observational drawing was a critical part of artist training but holes began to emerge in junior year. As I often tell my students, art is not about technique or having the ability to copy what's in front of you. Those are simply tools to do something greater. In advanced art classes, you are supposed to begin developing ideas and building a cohesive body of work, become a mature artist. But I was really lost at how to do this, so I instinctively did what I knew best. I continued to draw what I saw all around me, my family, and my surroundings. Now a side note, anytime you create anything at all, it is a self-portrait of who you are. Even if you are simply photographing or sculpting an object in front of you, even if you are writing and recording analytical observations, you are making innumerable decisions that say something about you. And so with these drawings of my family, they were clearly expressions of me, but they were very much unconscious expressions and I never thought deeply about what they were about. My approach to art making was very similar to the way I approached other aspects of my life. I lived each moment as it came without a conscious plan. While many individuals would hit the career road running after graduation, I put all my belongings into a storage locker and headed off backpacking through Europe and Scandinavia for two months. And a few years later, I did it again for four months, this time expanding my travels to Greece and Turkey. Yeah, that's me. Um, I, uh, some of you guys think I was born bald, but yeah, I did have lots of hair. Um, although the one on the left there is uh, in Greece, and the other one on the top there is Turkey. And I have a real love of carpet, so I threw that back there too. Um, this, this, uh, this wanderlust, the desire to experience the world, no doubt was a result of many motivations. An old high school friend recently told me that back in the day, I often spoke of getting out of my small hometown, the large suburb of Cleveland, to see the larger world. And I think in many ways, I never felt like I truly fit in there. But I think I was also traveling because I didn't know what I really wanted to do with my life. I knew for sure art would play a significant role. But as far as a career or what I thought a career was, I had no idea. 
I desire to do something significant, something meaningful, something that would make me happy. And I hope that, like the mythic characters I admired, going off on their own into the wilderness, that this experience would like, likewise help me find my way. In the years following these travels, I continued to make my work, participate in exhibits, and patch together a living. I was a waiter and an art instructor. I did some carpentry, quite poorly, and I bartended for seven years. I, was, I counted all my jobs, and I think I got to some place close to 30. While many of you beginning to think about college majors and the ensuing career might be rather freaked out by this way of living, I actually found this time and the freedom it brought forth to be incredibly exciting um, and full of possibilities. And since I had bounced around so much, I think it engendered a kind of confidence, a sense that all would work out if I just gave things time. And so it is with my teaching career. At the right age of 31, I began to desire a more conscious plan to straighten out my meandering road at least a little. I answered a newspaper ad and was offered a position as an art teacher at a community college all the way down in AC. Within a very short time, I was an adjunct teacher at a number of regional colleges, most notably the University of the Arts. Even though I was now a teacher, I still worked at the bar, and it was here that I met my wife, fell madly in love, got married, and moved to New Hope to live on a farm. Here we started a summer arts camp that included everything from art to music, dance, and drama. I was 32, life was good, I was incredibly happy, I was making art, I loved teaching at the college level. Our summer camp had grown to an enrollment of over 100 students, and I was making a pretty decent living. Yeah, that's Miles on the left. Um, but as life went on, unfortunately Miles is a visiting an orthopedic specialist today, so he doesn't get to share. Um, um, he did give me his permission to do that. Uh, but as life went on, the lack of security and benefits in teaching multiple part-time gigs was raising serious concerns, even for they back we love, and this became an even greater concern when at age 36 and 39, Miles and Sam arrived. There are definitely points in your life that make you feel like an adult, and most of them have to do with a sense of responsibility, things you have to do, and often for someone or something else other than yourself. Some of these are having a career, being in a real relationship, owning a home, but nothing rocks your world like having kids. Life became so much more intense and complex, and nothing challenged my meandering, carefree approach to life as being a parent. Having no plan or direction might have been okay for me, but that simply doesn't fly when you have kids. So as bizarre as it sounds, at age 41, I, accept, I accepted this position. It was my first full-time secure job, and it couldn't have been at a more perfectly timed and seemingly created for my exact skill set. It almost seemed predestined the way the position seemed to fall into my lap, and even more so since I didn't have any previous experiences in the private school world. Years later, I really thought there was some kind of divine intervention um, in that when workers were putting a new roof on my house, they discovered a layer of newspaper lining the plywood. And in this paper, an article on, yes, Germantown Academy and Kershaw, the house I am now in. I am pretty close to finishing up my 11th year at GA and my 52nd year of walking this planet. No plan Dave now has made plans to live to 100 so I can feel like, or he can feel like he's only halfway on his journey. It's hard to say how much my meanderings taught me, if they were all necessary, how much I am the same, how different. Here again, I feel kind of gray. Sometimes I think I've changed a lot, sometimes very little. I still live in the moment, and I surely meander, but slightly less so. What I do know for sure is that I wouldn't be here right now if it wasn't for all those crazy experiences, that they enriched my life in profound but unknowable ways. I also know I've gotten a hell of a lot more contemplative in middle age, and, and I now allow it to feed and play a conscious role in my artwork. I realized that maybe I haven't meandered as much as I thought, that my dream of being an artist has never meandered, and it has been straight and true. Um, I also can't stop thinking about who I am, where I come from, what I value. Growing older definitely does this, but being a teacher and a parent definitely brings this out. You guys challenge us to continually define what we find to be important, and you have no idea how much we love sharing that with you. 
So, a couple parting thoughts. I feel so fortunate to have been surrounded by people who have embraced my meandering ways. Go out and find people who embrace who you are and hold them close and dear. Do the same for them. A little follow-up to that, embrace who you are. You are all you got. Understand and embrace your flaws, your strengths. It is through this process that you can grow. Flexibility. Life is going to throw some crazy shit your way. <laughs> and you can't even begin to imagine where your road will lead you. Having a plan can be great, but being open to other possibilities gives you options and creates other possibilities. Find a mentor to guide your way. Definitely one of the true treasures at GA is the ability to really get to know your teachers and allow them to get to know you. I've been so fortunate for those that have guided me. I continue to be yearly with my grad professor from 30 years ago, and I cherish those times greatly. And lastly, my story, my path is just that. It's my path. I'm incredibly happy in my life. I did what I needed to do to be happy, and you have to go and do the same.